Sue and I are glad to be here with you once again at First Baptist Church Williams. We have been here before and appreciate your graciousness in putting up with, with me again. I know that uh, this is the first Sunday after your pastor has announced a call somewhere else. Now, may I just take a minute to tell you, I've been on both sides of that equation. And I know a little bit about what that's like, the pastor and family and for the church family. And I know that there's a mixture of feelings, perhaps you, you're thankful for the leadership of, of the Holy Spirit, but, but you're anxious and there's probably some grief on both sides. And there's the question, what are we going to do now? And who's going to be our next pastor? And where do we find him? And when will he come? May I just give a little word of advice from my years of pastoring? Go slow. Just go slow. Don't be in a hurry. Just wait, wait upon the Lord. Pray, pray, pray. Because God is preparing somebody somewhere just for this place. Be faithful unto the Lord. Be faithful unto your church and just, just let Him deal with you by His Spirit. It would be a good time to think about, well, who are we and where are we and where do we want to go? All of that will come from the wisdom and the direction of God. I wondered about what to uh, preach on today. I thought about you know, since this is the Sunday before uh, the 4th of July, something like uh, Bless God America. You know, we, we, we talk about God bless America. Well, bless the Lord, oh my soul, all, all that's in, within me. What about Bless God America? It almost seems as if God has stopped the world to say, all right, I want you to see something. You can't make it by yourself. You need me. But you know, I really, for some reason, have thought about preaching on this subject of divine health care. Divine health care. Health care is a, is a vital and important topic for each of us. Divine health care, coming from the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Mark chapter 2, 1 through 12. This is the miracle of Jesus healing the paralyzed man. And from this, we we talk about divine health care. Now, Mark is the first of the four Gospels written. Mark is a Gospel of very action and, and, and uh, immediacy and fast pace. He contains many miracles to describe Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of God, because of what he did. Mark, you know, is the one who is cousin to Barnabas, and he and Barnabas went on that mission trip with the Apostle Paul, and something happened, and maybe Mark got homesick and went home, and uh, that didn't sit too well with Paul, and, and there was a bit of a friction there between them, but you know what? They made up, because near the end of his letter to 2 Timothy, he said, bring Mark with you, because he's vital to me in the ministry. There are always times of reconciliation. God is not finished with us yet. But divine health care, the reading of God's Word, I'm going to be reading from the New International Version, uh, Mark chapter 2, 1 through 12. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Some men came bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get to him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, their faith, all of them, all four men and then the paralyzed man, each one of them was depicting some sort of faith. Jesus said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Already the storm clouds are beginning together and finding fault to Jesus to put him to death. Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts, and he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? 
Which is easier, to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take up your mat and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man, that's one of Jesus' favorite descriptions of himself, depicting as fully God and fully man, but the authority of God in him. The Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat, walked out in full view of them all, and this amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we've never seen anything like this before. Healthcare has changed dramatically in my lifetime, mostly for the better. I remember growing up, we had one doctor, one physician, Frank Gaston. And we called him Frank, and Frank made house calls. Anybody here remember your doctor or physician making house calls? I remember one specific time I'd been out of school for a day or two. I guess it was something like the flu, and finally they called the doctor, and Frank came out late one evening, and I remember I can hear him now coming down the hall, and he walks into my room, and he sits on the side of the bed, and he calls me Bud. Now, why he would always call me Bud, I don't know. I have no idea where that came from. But he sat there, and he put his little black bag on the, on the side of the bed, and I was frightened that he was going to reach in there and pull out that sh uh, shot thing, that syringe thing, and give me a shot. But he talked for a while. And then he, he looked at my throat and he looked at my ears and he listened to my chest. And then he, he wrote a prescription. But he always said this. He always said to my folks, now give him a lot of liquids and a lot of fruit and a lot of fruit juices and things like that and he can go back to school. Thanks a lot, Frank. <laughs> if you went to his office, you took a number and they'd call your number. And something I really didn't realize back in those days, but it was $10 a visit. $10 a visit for years and years and years. Today, I have a cardiologist, a neurologist, a urologist, a dermatologist, a primary care physician, and a surgeon. And the only one left that my wife says that we need is a psychiatrist. You know, health care has changed. Health care was very primitive, very simple in Jesus' day in New Testament times. Most of the people actually just used some old family wives' tales or some, some plants and herbs and spices and things like that. Many people in New Testament times felt that their illness was because some god or god was angry at them. Hippocrates is noted as the Father of modern medicine kind of began to change that around when he, he said that illnesses came from some sort of clinical problem. There were doctors in the, well, they even mentioned a couple of times in the Old Testament, and they were physicians in the New Testament. Of course, Dr. Luke. Luke. We don't know anything about his practice because it seems he was always writing about one-fourth of the New Testament or he was on a mission trip. Josephus, the very, very reliable uh, secular Jewish historian, tells us that there was a, a medical school in the town of Tarsus. That's where Paul is from. And he said there were some others in some of the other places where Paul visited, but none is ever mentioned in that. But when Jesus came along, he instituted divine health care. He was concerned about the whole person, as we say it, mentally, physically, and spiritually. And so here he is in Capernaum. Capernaum was a, a fishing village on the northwestern shore of the Sea of Galilee. And it was, as you would call it, uh, his headquarters for his Galilean ministry. He came, as Mark says in the previous chapter, to the synagogue. I've seen some of the ruins of the synagogue of Capernaum. And it is believed that those ruins were from the the second synagogue, maybe the second century, over the original synagogue. But there, there is a, a cornerstone or a, a column there that has these names inscribed on it. John, Zebedee, Alphaeus, some New Testament characters. Could that very cornerstone have heard the words of the Lord himself? 
All right, then Mark says in this text that he came back home, came back to the house. Whose house? Not sure, but probably was the home of Simon Peter because Mark tells us in that previous chapter that he, Jesus, went with Simon, that Simon Peter, and Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, into Simon Peter's house. And his mother-in-law was sick with a fever. Remember that story? And Jesus healed her. And then it says, you know, he came back to the house and they were crowded in there like sardines in a can. And nobody else could get in there. And Jesus was preaching and teaching the word to them. What would he have said, do you imagine? Maybe something like Mark says when he introduces his gospel. Then came Jesus saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He might have said, been saying something like Matthew records in the Sermon on the Mount about the light of the world and the salt of the earth. He might have talked to them about love and forgiveness and purpose in life and hope and eternal life. And he was preaching there and teaching there and they were just crowded in and these four men, you know that story, these four men brought their friend to Jesus. They knew if they could get him in the presence of the Lord that something good could happen. Those four men had to exercise some faith. That paralyzed man, we don't know why, whether he had had a stroke or whether he was born that way or he'd had an accident or what, but he had the faith also that if he could just get in front of the Messiah, in front of Christ, divine health care, that something good could happen. They couldn't get in. I've never preached anywhere where it was so crowded that nobody else could get in. I mean, a few could slip out, but nobody else could get in. <laughs> the King James Version says they couldn't get in for the press. I've heard a few little chuckles about that, the press. What if the media were there? What if the media, they couldn't get in because of the media. CBS, a Capernaum Broadcasting System or something like that. Would they have described what went on with fairness? And openness, well, they couldn't get in. And so somebody had the great idea, let's go up and, and make a hole in the roof and lower him down. So most of those houses, especially in Capernaum in those times, opened right up on the street, on the, on the road, and they had, a, they had a, some steps or a ladder built onto the side of the house so that many people, they could go up and put their laundry up there to dry and other things. So they climbed up to the roof. And it would have been simple to just tear a hole in the roof because it was just some wood beams across, uh, across there and some dried mud and some straw. And it wouldn't have been difficult and it wouldn't have been hard to repair it either. And so they tore a hole in the roof and those guys, you just imagine this, okay? Let's go to Capernaum. And they are lowering him down Wow, this crowd was mesmerized by the teachings of Jesus. And you're sitting there, and all of a sudden there's a little bit of straw that kind of fell around you, and you thought nothing of it, but then a little bit of, of, of dried mud and dirt. And, and you look up, and there are these, this guy's being let down. Please don't think evil of me when I say this now, Okay. Just because one is in the ministry, just because one is uh, a seminary student, does not mean that that one loses his humor or his sense of humor or mischievousness. When I went to seminary at Texas, I was single. In fact, that's where Sue and I met. And I lived in the men's resident hall for a couple of years, and you'd walk in there, and there was this, this big stairway on either side, all the way to the third floor. And you could be on the third floor and you could look right down the stairwell. You could see people coming in the front door or gathering around the front steps. Now, from time to time, we had student-led prayer meetings. And I went to the student-led prayer meetings most of the time. But one night we had one and, well, I didn't go. I guess I had to study. And so a friend of mine and I were up on the third floor and we had a couple of bottles of bubbles. 
And we just started blowing bubbles. Those guys were down there really praying hard and earnestly. And we were up there just blowing bubbles and all those hundreds of bubbles just silently, perfectly floated right on down. And I remember peeping over and I watched them come down and one came down and hit this old boy right kind of on the bridge of his nose. And then another one came down and hit him on his forehead. And he was in prayer, but he looks up and all he saw was bubbles. I guess he thought maybe the rapture had come or the parousia or, or something. What a look on his face, if I could just describe it. That might have been how they were when they let that man down that day. And when he was lowered in, in, in the, at the feet of Jesus, Jesus said this, Son, that could be translated, My child, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now there was some legalistic teachers of the law who were there. And they didn't say anything, but they were thinking it in their minds. Who is this fellow? How dare him say, your sins are forgiven? He's a blasphemer. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew what they were thinking. He knows our thoughts. Scripture says somewhere, let every thought be brought into captivity. Of Jesus Christ. We'll give account of every deed, every thought. No wonder the psalmist said, Search me, O God, know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me. Well, he knew their thoughts. He said, Why are you thinking that? Which is hardest? Sons, your sins are forgiven or take up your bed and walk so that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said, Son, get up, take up your mat and get out of here. And miraculously he did. And Mark says, those folks were so amazed, they said, well, we've never seen anything like this before. Now that's the miracle. What's the application for you and me? Number one, there's Jesus. Jesus, the exemplar of our faith. All scripture must be interpreted in light of the person and work of Jesus Christ. He is the center of all scripture. He said, I and my Father are one. He who has seen me has seen the Father. The New Testament says in him, all the fullness of God dwells. 100% God, 100% man, God in human flesh. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. What else do you know about him? He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He's called the bread of life, the bread of heaven, the day spring, deliverer, door, good shepherd, and on and on. Jesus is the center. It calls us to him. Second, Jesus forgives sin. He forgives sin. This man had a need. He may have thought that he was paralyzed because of his sin, but there's no, no, no warrant to saying that Jesus felt that way. But he had a need, and we have a need. For all of us have sinned and continue to fall short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. Here is a scripture I want you to mark in your Bible or make a note of, please. 1 John, the little book of 1 John, chapter 5, verse 13. 1 John 5, 13. Now this is to believers. This is to Christians, as it were. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us and to go on cleansing us from all unrighteousness. You see, we can walk around with some unconfessed sin in here. Isaiah 1.18, come now, let's reason together. Let's settle this matter. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Jeremiah 33.8, and I will cleanse them from all iniquity whereby they have sinned against me and whereby they have committed iniquity. And Psalm 103, as far as the east is from the west, so far have I removed your transgressions from you? You see, he forgives sin. And you read in the book of Acts, all those early preachers and apostles preaching, they, they would preach that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried. He rose again the third day. And in him there is preached the forgiveness of sins. 
The third thing, though, is faith. How's your faith? How's my faith today? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Therefore, we are, by, we are justified by faith. Faith. I think most of us here probably know who Dabo Sweeney is, the football coach. Back in March, when this pandemic really started shutting things down, didn't know what was going to happen, somebody interviewed him and asked him, do you think there'll be a, a football season come fall? He said, yes, I think so. He's, you see, he's a glass half full kind of guy. Well, he was just raked over the coals for saying that. He was just criticized. How dare you think about that when this terrible thing is happening? He said, I'm criticized if I speak. I'm criticized if I don't. But in another interview, this is what he said. Faith and fear are the same thing. It is believing in something you can't see. I just choose faith. I believe in God. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, all, all that I have seen teaches me to trust the Creator for all that I have not seen. And I tell you, brothers and sisters, it takes as much faith or more to have faith and trust in God even when there is no miracle and even when God seems to be silent. Divine health care. When Jesus healed that 12-year-old daughter of Jairus later on in this book, he was the divine pediatrician. When he healed the blind man, he was the divine ophthalmologist. When he healed the leper, he was the divine dermatologist. When he healed the uh, man who couldn't hear, the deaf man, he was the divine audiologist. When he healed the paralyzed man, he was the divine neurologist. And when he said, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest, take my yoke upon you, learn of me, peace I give unto you, he was the divine psychiatrist. The great physician. And the insurance premium has been paid completely, fully by him, by his blood. Jesus Divine health care, the great physician. Twice battered and scarred in the auction here, thought it scarcely worth his while, but he held it up with a smile. What am I bidding, good folks? He cried. Who'll start the bidding for me? A dollar, a dollar. Now who'll make it two, two dollars? Who'll make it three? Three dollars once, three dollars twice, going for three? But no. From the room far back, a gray-haired man came forward and picked up the bow. Then wiping the dust from the old violin and tightening up all the strings, he played a melody pure and sweet, as sweet as the angel sings. Well, the music ceased, and the auctioneer, with a voice that was quiet and low, said, what am I bid for the old violin? And he held it up with the bow. A thousand dollars, a thousand, who'll make it two? Two thousand, who'll make it three? Three thousand once, three thousand twice, going, gone, said he. Well, the people cheered, but some of them cried, we do not quite understand what changed its worth. The man replied, the touch of the master's hand. And many a man with life out of tune and battered and torn with sin is auctioned cheap to a thoughtless crowd, much like that old violin, a mess, a pottage, a glass of wine, a game he travels on. He's going once, he's going twice, he's going, he's almost gone. But the master comes and the foolish crowd never can quite understand the worth of a soul and the change that's wrought by the touch of the master's hand. The divine physician. May he touch us again. Eternal God, our Father, we thank you for this, this word, this hope. We pray for your touch upon us. We pray for your direction and wisdom upon this congregation of believers because they are yours. We commit ourselves, we commit them and this church into your plan now and forevermore. Amen.